the other thing she did is, is adding these uh, these iron and, and gold um, tags, I guess if you like, to help you monitor it, lets you figure out how toxic the system is in, in the regions, but um, in these cancerous regions, and watch in real time how effective your treatment is. This is just absolutely incredible stuff. It's incredible. Yeah, so she spent over a thousand hours since 2009 uh, looking into this. She's also won previous awards for, for stuff, and she's clearly, she's clearly quite something. Um, but, but just, I mean, this is this sort of thing is, is stuff that, that big labs with people with PhDs battle over for, for years and years and years. <laughs> Uh, and, yeah. and, and to teach herself, you know, she's taught herself chemical engineering, biomedical engineering, and physics. And, and uh, apparently also likes playing the piano and golf, and would like to be a research professor one day. And I'm thinking it's probably pretty likely. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't think <laughs> that she's going to be at Starbucks for an extended period of time. <laughs> But yes, so clever, and it does make so much sense, you know, target the stem cells, target the, the root of the matter as opposed to, you know, the, the, what's coming from it. We'll, we'll be watching her with a great amount of interest, as I'm sure are, are large parts of the world. Indeed. All right, and um, right, the, so the next bit that, that you guys will hear is, is Elf getting to chat with a bunch of our side bloggers on Thursday. Um, I was not able to be there, but, but he did a, a, just a fantastic job of chatting with them. So, um, yeah, uh, take it away, Elf. So, uh, before, we, before we cut to the clip, we should also apologize for the background noise. Oh, yeah. we, uh, we managed to entice them to come and meet us by holding our meeting and recording session at a local pub in Wellington. So, uh, forgive the background noise. Okay, so just um, going around, if we could each introduce ourselves. So I'm Elf, I'm one of the hosts of the official Cyblogs podcast, and uh, we decided to have a wee bit of a round table, because a few of the Cyblog Cybloggers are actually in Wellington at the moment. So, My name is Peter Griffin, I'm the editor of Cyblogs and the manager of the Science Media Centre. And I'm Ken Atkinson, I'm a former journalist uh, working at the uh, Science Media Centre at the moment. I'm John Kerr, and guess what? I work at the Science Media Centre as well. I'm Kim Kerr. I don't live in the time, but I, my blog is open to power assumptions, which I've been going for about five years And my name is Sean Kenny, and, and um, well, I've been blogging for a couple of years now um, under a blog called A Measure of Science. All right, well, without further ado, let's get on to some of these awkward questions that are going to put people in strange uh, strange positions. So, uh, it's often said that New Zealand science is forced, because of our small size, um, for funding to pick winners. I want to know what you guys think of this strategy and which winning technologies you guys would pick to invest in. Well, I'd, I'd better kick off on this one. So I've written a couple of blog posts on it. Well, you know, we've been picking winners for a long time, right? I mean, and, and the argument is that you know we've got at agriculture, we've got at growing things, we've got at growing plants, we've got at growing animals. You know, we, you know, we sell these things offshore, and um, actually, it, you know, it turns out that that's a, that's a bit of a you know, bit of a cul-de-sac. Right? You, you, you can only get so good at, at doing these things, and then you start to hit with natural resource constraints, um, and actually, you know, we've got to start doing new things. And I think I think that's one of the things that's constrained our thinking. An example I like to think of is, um, uh, uh, is you know, is, is icebreaker, right? So icebreaker is a, you know, it's, it's a it's a success, right? A lot of people talk it up. It's got very clever marketing behind it. It's done really well. Um, it's based on Merino wool, um, but actually, you know, it turns out that, that Gore-Tex was actually invented in New Zealand. Um, Gore-Tex is manufactured, you know, it's, it's, it's an American product. Um, the markets are the same, right? If you own a piece of Gore-Tex, you've probably got a piece of Icebreaker as well. Um, you know, why is it that Americans feel they can sell something made, made from a polymer, from a plastic material? Um, Whereas we only think we can sell something made from Merino wool. I mean, I think it's really interesting that our mindset says that we can't do one when we can do the other, when the, the market's efficient. So, yeah. But who picks, who picks the, uh, the winners? Because you've had New Zealand Science uh, uh, reorganised uh, a couple of times since the mid-80s, uh, largely to uh, avoid politicians picking their favourites uh, is the thing to be funded with taxpayer money. I actually, look, I think it's all of us, right? Mm -hmm. I think we, as a country we have a mindset that, that our economy is based on natural resources. Right? And, you know, I don't think it's any particular person. You know, it's not the government. 
uh, it's not the CRIs and the universities or the public, we all think this way. And we think if we're going to be make a success of something, it better be based on our natural resources. Yeah. And actually, you know, when we've had a good idea, you know, like I said with Gore-Tex, that was, that was you know, developed in New Zealand, um, the, the manufacturing process to make that, you know, why didn't that take off as a business in New Zealand, yeah. whereas Icebreaker has? You know, the markets are identical. Yeah. You know, we, we decided uh, several years ago to focus on some key areas in New Zealand. We went with biotech, we went with IT, we went with creative. We've had some success, particularly in the creative space, with thanks to Peter Jackson, really. And others, not so much. And we've made actual direct loans and that to, to IT companies that haven't really paid off. And that, I think that shows the danger of actually focusing really specifically on types of technologies and areas to invest in, where it really should be more of a uh, uh, industry uh, or, or wide focus uh, so that you can actually create an environment where all sorts of different technologies uh, flourish. I, I think a lot of those efforts have been, by, you know, people have made the argument that you actually need you need some scale to start with. Right? Although we've said, yes, we need to move from shipping commodities to uh, more advanced products, right? we've always, the talk is always about actually turning those commodities into more advanced products. Whereas, you know, the reality is that, that a lot of you know, high-value products don't come from commodities. Right? You know, they're, they're, they're not... They're not based on natural resources. They're, they're, you know, Silicon Valley is not based on a mound of silicon um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's based on, on knowledge and thinking. And I think that's what we've failed to do in New Zealand. As a question of how we as a people think in New Zealand, we need to change the way we think away from some of these primary resources. How do, how do you do that? Well, look, I think we're doing that, actually. You know, conversations like this, right? I mean, I... Talking to Greg Shannon from the Guardian, who puts out the Ten One Hundred report, and, you know, he, he he started putting that out because he was frustrated, you know, on the summer barbecue, like right, going on to barbecues and people, you know, talking about how we should back our strengths and focus on agriculture, and no one was aware that we're actually doing some things that are very very clever, you know, Fisher and Park Healthcare, it's not based on any natural resources, so it's a rapidly growing company, you know, over five hundred million. Revenue this year. Um, there's no natural resource for us, right? It's just knowledge. It's knowledge and engineers. And when you go there and, and visit the farm, you see that really, you know, that's what they're doing. It's, it's, it's engineers that are, that are producing the product. Here. But the people who decide where you're going to put the money, invest the money in New Zealand, uh, often boards that don't have scientists or engineers on them. Uh, they're made up of accountants and lawyers and, and uh, various other odds and sods. Uh, surely that is the, at the crux of the problem. People are not looking to the potential to make money out of science. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think again, that's a bit of a cultural problem. Um, yeah, you know, definitely we need we need scientists to be more entrepreneurial. I mean, they need to be looking for opportunities to exploit the knowledge that they make. That's that's not to say that every scientist has to be that way, but we you know we just definitely need to have a culture uh, of entrepreneurship among scientists yeah. and a willingness to get involved in business. The the, the the one good thing we're seeing in New Zealand, and it's just been a matter of time really, is as scientists and technologists and that who've made money, they've sold out of their companies. You look at Rod Drury who sold zero. You've got people like Paul Callahan. You've got Sam Morgan, who made a lot of money out of the sale of trade me, is now investing in science and technology ventures. And that we're starting to see a, a maturing of the, the expertise in New Zealand. And it's all about leadership, really. We now have people who are attracting the likes of Peter Thiel, who was one of the founders of eBay, who has hundreds of millions of dollars to invest. He is now investing in New Zealand companies. Uh, we've got Lancer Tech, which has attracted an investment from some of the best companies and people in Silicon Valley. So we have got to a stage now, and as Sean says, the size of the industry, you know, this is approaching a, a five or six billion dollar industry now, the high tech sector, there is enough scale there to actually get stuff done. Okay, cool. So I'm hearing hearing uh, lots of good things about not picking the obvious winners. So going back to the last part of that question, which winners would you pick if you were forced to? <laughs> <laughs> Why, why should you have to pick winners? I think part of the problem has been in the past that people have picked winners that talked about biotechnology and then the next fashion. So we've had, well, from my perspective, it's been um, almost an ideologically driven leadership, particularly in the CRIs, where 
the CEO gets a particular thing in his or her head about what the next thing is, and then when they when they're replaced, there's another new thing, you know. And and I, I either suspect that because there's a picking of winners, that all the diversity that occurs in that for individual scientists is ignored, you know. And people are cha- they're attempted to there's an attempt to channel people into what's seen as the winner, when in fact. Perhaps we should listen to the scientists and, and promote their ideas, even if they're not seen as winners at the moment. So the, the, the problem, sure, is that if you concentrate on picking winners, where is the money to go into the, the basic science, which is going to provide the fundamentals for finding future winners in the future? Uh, well, future winners at some point. Uh, you're going to have to spread your money, you need to spread your investment so that you're not only choosing things that can be where science can be brought into the wider economy and benefit everyone you've still got to have people out there doing the, the basic science that's going to provide the, 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 the platform on which everything in the future will be based and if you favour one over the other there's a disconnect and, and, and you lose your science sector I mean, the challenge for a country like New Zealand is, you know, of course, we often don't capture the benefit from our own basic science. Right? That's the argument that's made. That it's, it's, you know, yes, we do good science, but then a lot of that gets exploited offshore, whereas the applied science is the stuff that we keep here because we've got that knowledge. But, I, you know, I think that's a bit... You know, so I can understand that argument, but actually, really, when, you, you know, when you're talking to young people going into science and, you know... And, where people learn their skills in science, it's those basic questions that really motivate people. You know, it's that basic knowledge. That's why that's why kids go into science. That's why young people go into science. So if you do let that that basic science drop away, because you're being pragmatic and because you just don't, you know, a very simple cost benefit analysis, yeah, I think you lose that motivation for doing science in the first place. Plus, a lot of young people want to make the world a better place, and they see research for non-monetary purposes yep. as, as a way to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if you if you poll the students in the McDiamond Institute, we've got one sitting over here. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of them. They, that's what. They, that's why they're there. They want to make. The, you know, they want to answer some of these fundamental questions. They don't want to make megabucks. Um, they, you know, they want to improve society. Yeah. Improve I, will, I will also point out at this point that some are there because they just don't know what else to do. You're okay. All right. <laughs> we're figuring it out. I thought those people were teaching. Or podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there are obvious areas we we just cannot go. Really, the nature of our economy. We're not. We can't build semiconductor fabrication plants for instance we're not really good at building you know uh, wind turbines the, the Danish sort of have the market cornered and the Chinese to some extent but the stuff that we're particularly good at we're really good at software in New Zealand and it's a burgeoning market you've got a system now where you can create an app that goes on a Google Android device or an iPad and you can sell that in a digital marketplace anywhere in the world that is the true weightless economy and we have people companies like Polar Bear Farm that are selling their software all around the world there's no reason that why we cannot make a, a, a multi-million dollar business out of that from here in New Zealand I wonder whether we should be looking at rather than picking a winner picking a problem I think we have problems in New Zealand which we could work on which are relevant to the rest of the world and this is where I think this idea of a green uh, a green business comes in, you know, we have waste problems in New Zealand which if we solve, we can export export the science around that uh, to, to other countries, so in a, in a sense, picking the winner should be tied in with picking the problem as well Real problems which which we face and the rest of the world faces. But, yeah. but if New Zealand technology finds a way, for instance, to turn the uh, uh, carbon dioxide from uh, steel mills into other useful uh, commodities, mm. um, we can do, we can do that. So, uh, but the question is, how do you get the investment capital to make the transition from the basic research to turning that process into something that uh, you find in China or, or America or, or, or 
Europe and, and, and all, all those places. Yeah. All right, guys, I'm just going to cut off the discussion there to go through uh, some of the other random things I have written down. <laughs> that was a good one.